All right, let's get started. Okay. Um, for those, well, I'd like to welcome you to the Let's Yap About It podcast. Um, I have a special guest tonight, um, City Councilman, uh, City Councilwoman uh, Letitia Plummer, um, who's actually presenting a proposal on to behalf of the uh, Houston Police Department. Um, I'd like you to definitely uh, take the time uh, and also welcome everybody in. Definitely come in. We have a lot of uh, uh, interesting questions that we're going to have for her tonight. And I just want you guys to sit back and uh, I want you to listen to her perspective and her angle on presenting this, because I think that this is a big step uh, in moving forward uh, in the process. So you guys to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourselves today. And uh, we have a special treat with you uh, on tonight. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Houston's own uh, City Councilwoman Letitia Plummer. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. I appreciate it. This is a great way to start my week. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So um, <laughs> for those uh, that are not familiar with you, please introduce yourself to the City of Houston. Absolutely. So I am Letitia Plummer. I uh, am a daughter of um, a local Houstonian, Matthew Plummer. Uh, he's been practicing dentistry here for decades. I mean, I think 40 years now. I'm also a daughter of immigrant. My mom is actually from, from East Africa originally. Uh, bloodline wise, she's actually Indian and Arab. So uh, she got here. My dad met her in Africa uh, when he was in the Peace Corps. So really cool background. I always tell folks, I don't know if we're going to have fried chicken or curry at my house. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's nice. It's nice um, because I feel like it allows me to really relate to what Houston looks like because we lead in diversity as long as, 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 as many of you know. Um, I'm a single mom of three phenomenal boys at 21, 18, and 16. And um, they're my lifeline. And they're the reasons why I wake up every morning and work as hard as I do. Uh, and, and, and they're one of the reasons why I'm so active and, um, and uh, intentional about police reform. Um, I'm a practicing dentist for now 22 years practicing. I followed my dad's footsteps. Uh, I went to Baylor College of Dentistry after I graduated from Spelman. So I'm H an HBCU grad, which is awesome. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, I feel like I'm a great blend of everything that Houston has to offer. And that's why I'm able to really look at all the things that we're trying to push through uh, from a different perspective and a different lens. So thanks for having me. Oh, 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 oh most definitely. Um, I, I, this is a treat for me as well. Um, and I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of all the food. <laughs> Thank you. As well, so. <laughs> so um, here's my thing. Uh, what inspired you to get into politics and who were your mentors and uh, influence? Yeah, so no, great question. So this is kind of one of those questions that um, I love because honestly, Robert, I never thought in a million years I'd be in politics. Um, my, my, um, my brother's godfather is Mickey Leland, um, our late Congressman Mickey Leland. Um, Al Green, Congressman Green is a great friend of our family. Uh, you know, we've been around politics for a long time. My dad was never a politician per se, but he, you know, being one of the first black doctors in Houston, um, he typically his, his patient base was people and bottom around people um, that were in the political space. And so I've been around it. My, my grandfather was one of the first African-American judges in the state of Texas. And he was a civil rights attorney and um, he actually desegregated the Harris County jail system. So it's, it's been in my blood. It's around me. It's been around me, but I never thought that I would be in that space. I just thought I'd raise my family, be a dentist and kind of go on my merry way. Um, but in 2014, had a tragedy that happened to me. I lost legal custody of my son. And um, it was a surrogacy, um, a surrogacy case. We had him through a surrogate. I asked for intermenopause very, very early in life. Um, and, uh, and because the state laws, I wasn't able to gain custody of him. I would have had to adopt him. And because the state laws that were in place, I'm, I being the intended parent, the non-biological parent, I didn't have any rights to, to have custody of him. 
And so through the divorce, um, I actually lost custody. and He's now five years old. Uh, and so that obviously was one of the lowest points in my life. But also, I believe, like, I believe I rose in that space as well. And so what I decided to do was change the law. And so I wrote the, I wrote the legislation to change um, the way that the, um, the family code was written uh, when it came to women that were, um, that were non-fertile or infertile and couldn't ha continue to have children and chose to use surrogacy as a way to continue to have their families. And so uh, we had to go through two legislative councils, uh, two legislative uh, sessions, but our last session it actually passed unanimously on the House and the Senate. So it was an amazing, amazing feat. Uh, it is definitely, I'm a very spiritual person. So it was, the re you know, I believe that God gives us challenges and most of the time we can handle them. It's just our perspective. And so ever since I did that, honestly, I got bit by the bug. And um, I just continued to, to, to uh, be engaged um, from community-based perspective. Um, I started the first League of Women Voters chapter in Missouri County, um, just very engaged with the Women's March, just really trying to use my voice uh, for people that just didn't have one. And so, uh, and now here I am. I am your council member for the third largest city in the nation, and, um, and I'm really excited to be here. So, um, it was from a place of, of pain, I think, that I'm here, but I'm definitely using it to my advantage, and I'm so grateful for Houston to bring me in this space. And we and we and we appreciate you, and we love and we love that you're here uh, to di to give us that different angle. Um, now, for your uh, proposal, now this is a very direct step by step in the handling of citizens uh, in the city of Houston. Um, how did you come up with such a great proposal? Sure. So, yeah, I come from the private sector. And so in, in, in that, it's very different from public work. Uh, in the private sector, you know, you, you write drafts of proposals, you see how everything would be implemented, and then you execute it, and then you see it happen and come to fruition. Uh, so that mindset, um, that, that mindset really allows me to be very, um, not only intentional about what we want to do, but also very organized. And as um, just as a business owner, as a doctor, as a mother, uh, kind of watching how reform was, how policing was is done with all of the things that have been happening with Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd and all the other travesties that happen in our communities. One thing I realized was, um, and because I'm also a solution oriented person, you know, I tell folks, if I'm, you know, if, I, if you come to my office and say your tooth hurts, I can't say, well, I'll fix it next week or let me figure it out. I have to be very definitive on what I'm going to do to fix the problem. And that's kind of where my brain works and how it works. So I always try to come to the root problem. So if someone has a toothache, it is, they just don't wake up with it, right? They had a, a cavity early on. They had a twinge. They knew the problem was there. So we have to come up with the preventive reasons of, of how we create change. And that's all what I did. I said, okay, if someone's in jail, a person of color is in jail, let's back up to where maybe he's 20. What happened to him when he was five? You know, who is influencing his life or her life? You know, what access to good food did he have? What access to education did he have? Was his dad and mom around? Was he available to have both parents in the household? You know, was it a single family? Did he live on the street at some point in his life? Or did he have, his parents have a good job and they were able to, um, you know, present a good, safe uh, space for them to live? Did he live with grandma? You know, what, how did that look? And as he got older, did mentors come and talk to him when he was in school? Did he have books? Or do you have computers or do you have nothing? Uh, did he have Wi-Fi in his space? Like what, what happened as he was matriculated through high school? When he got to, you know, got to high school, did was college ever an option for him? Was, was being an athlete the only way for him to go to college? Like what were the stories about what that looked like and how did that transgress? Okay, so we graduated from high school. Was he able to be an entrepreneur? Did he go to college? What would what the what fork in forks in the road did he have available to him? And if he wasn't able to do that, where is he now? And why is he in jail? So I'm very intentional about looking back to where people start because I feel, I feel like if we look at that space, then that's how we change what the future looks like. And so what did we do? We said, okay, let's put money into making sure housing is available to them. Let's make sure if there are mental health concerns, we put something in place that doesn't have to have that person interact with police at all. Let's make sure that they're good grocery stores and communities. And if they want to be entrepreneurs, there's funding available for them um, in small business ownership so they can take care of their families and be entrepreneurs they want to be. You know, uh, if they were incarcerated for reentry, let's make sure they don't go back to jail. Let's make sure they have all that they need. So these are social 
uh, social safety nets that are in place that should be in place for people uh, so they can thrive um, in the future and make sure that they're not incarcerated. And so that's all we did. We just looked at the, the basic stuff of what we're missing because now the criminal justice system is, a, is a basically a catch-all for the lack of social services that we have. And we just created that. And then what is the one thing that everyone needs to make sure a program works? That's dollars. And so we just attached dollars to it. And so it wasn't like it wasn't just some this this astronomical way of thinking. It was a basic way of thinking and giving people what they need to be able to be supported and do the things they want to do. And that's really as simple as it was. And um, and and so attaching the dollars to it was a really big part of it. And that's why we uh, tried to push those amendments through during the budget process. Because the way the city works is that anything, any programs or anything that you want to do with, with um, you know, that you want the city to deal with for that year, it's got to be approved in the budget process. Okay. 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 Now, now, now here, you know, I'm going to get to um, something serious. And okay. one of the things that I um, want to talk about now, with police brutality and police communication be um, between lower income parts of the city being poor mm -hmm. and now affecting um, everybody's everyday life, do you think that this proposal would be something that could mend relationships between citizens and police? Absolutely. But in a lot of ways, I want to prevent the interaction from happening at all, right? I want to not even put our black and brown folks even in the space where they have to have that interaction. Right. And so, and, and yes, so, and once, if we can eliminate that part of it, we're, we're a quarter there. We're a quarter of the way there. Um, but, but yes, to answer your question, absolutely, because you put money into training also, um, implicit buying, bi um, bias training too. Um, I want to make sure that police officers are not basically surfing through poor neighborhoods. Right. And that's why um, our site and release, the site and release executive order that the mayor pushed through is, is good. I mean, it's definitely a great start. But I don't but, you know, what we see is more than 45 percent of people that are stopped or searched. And about 30 percent of those people actually when they're searched, they end up, you know, having to um, be taken into jail. So we want to prevent all that from even happening. Um, but do I think it's going to change the relationships? You know, um, the only way the relationships are going to change, in my mind, is two ways. One, we change the personnel of the police department. We have it mimic more of what Houston looks like from a diversity perspective. Uh, we change the upper level management of, of the police department to make sure that if we've got 30% black people, that 30% of leadership um, looks in that way. And then we make sure that the races that are represented within the department are not just black people or Asian people or Hispanic people, but really understand that those are that those cultural differences are um, are understood and respected within the department. Because as we're seeing very clearly right now, just because you're a black person doesn't mean you support black issues, right? Absolutely. And so we want to make sure that they understand that too. That's a big piece of it also. So it's not just kind of this one, um, this one. Um, quick decision switch, right, that turns on and off. It's really changing the actual culture of the department um, that's going to change the relationships um, more than anything in my mind. And one of the things that I, um, that I can um, understand coming from uh, the, my neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. I've actually grew up in the uh, Northeast Houston area from Homestead uh, to Cynic Woods okay. and Trinity Garden. And, and yeah, I've actually talked to the community and they talk about how there are certain officers uh, that actually give a certain level of harassment to individuals who have a prior past. You know what I'm saying? They definitely had uh, things that went on in their past life and they feel like it's a consistent, it's an ongoing issue and people are tired of it. And one thing that they're, they're very tired of is just just assuming that just because I'm the skin color of being black is that I'm up to something. If it's a more than about three or four of us gathered together, we're up plotting or something. And, and I think that that's just ridiculous to have. And I think it's just be, honestly blatant, just racial profiling. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's fair to a community because I've lived in different communities and everywhere I went, it's the same story. And I believe that that has to change. And I believe even the laws have to change because even from a perspective of stop and frisk, you can basically, and I'm, and I'm saying this, and I believe this within the police department, they push from a stop and frisk perspective to get something or get a rise out of a person to justify arresting. And I don't believe 
that, you know, it may be an innocent kid that's never had an interaction with the law, period. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. threw a, 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 a verbal spat with him. That officer mm -hmm. assumes his authority naturally um, to me, and I'm being honest, talking has never been physical. Officers mm -hmm. like to grab, and I believe that there should be certain protocols that should happen before you even approach an individual. Probable cause cannot be that you just see him holding something and you think it's it's something to harm or to do anything to anybody. And, and especially when African-Americans and even also Hispanics are in groups, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel and I feel strong from a community perspective that that needs to change. No, absolutely. My son was, um, I think Sharif was eighth grade uh, and was walking in West University and got pulled over by a cop. He was walking. He was just walking down the street to another friend's house. And the police officer said he looked like someone that had broken into one of the houses in West University. And if that kid's, his friend's mom, white woman, run, didn't run down the street to say, no, 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 he's actually my son's friend. Um, then the Shreef would have probably been, been taken in that day. And so it doesn't matter what you got on, it doesn't matter what neighborhood you're in. Um, unfortunately, Black people, have, we, we are, like you said, I mean, they're, they're natural prejudices um, that are attached to that. And that's what I mean about changing the culture of the department, uh, changing the people that we, um, the police force, changing the cadet, what does the cadet class look like? you know, um, and making sure that they understand and, and really their character. I mean, we can't, we can teach training. We can, we can teach, you know, um, um, you know, um, use of force issue. You know, we can, teach, we can teach all of that, but we can't teach someone's character and we can't teach their compassion and the reason for being fair and their understanding that they're supposed to be peace officers. That's what their purpose is. And you can't really teach that. So really that's what I mean about, you know, um, who is, who is actually in the department themselves. And then we have to not protect them as much as we do. We have to make sure that they understand that if you do have an offense, it's gonna be publicly recognized. We are gonna create an independent board that's truly independent, that you won't be able to go in and fix. We are gonna support a national database to where if you do you have certain offenses, then you won't be able to you know, be able to be hired anywhere else. These are these are policy issues, right? But also a very, very um, specific to our personnel. And the personnel has to change too. So they're really two different pieces. Um, but we have to look at them separately, but then the marriage of them is is, is really important. Okay. Um now I'm a, uh, now I, I'm all for your proposal, but I believe that there's one person particularly that's going to stand in the way, um, mm -hmm. and he's been vocal. His name is Joe uh, Grimaldi. Has been mm -hmm. very vocal in the police union mm -hmm. about being mm -hmm. sick and tired of criminals and dirt bags, and also going against County Judge Hidalgo, criticizing mm -hmm. her orders. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm quoting you. I'm quoting him on this. He said he wanted to be very clear that Houston Police Officers Union believes everyone should be wearing, uh, uh, should be protected. Um, now, for him to call certain people criminals and dirtbags, this is in relation to that. Uh, uh, and my heart goes out to those two innocent people when they went in there uh, on a warrant saying that they sold drugs and they shot into mm -hmm. that house and come mm -hmm. to find out that that wasn't even the case and for him to cover for them. I think mm -hmm. Joe Grimaldi is going to be a big uh, uh, problem in the way of you actually getting this proposal off. And what do you say to, uh, or what do you even say about Joe Grimaldi and to me his low level policing tactics, especially when it comes to, I, I believe people uh, in lower income neighborhoods. I believe mm -hmm. that he has a whole different mindset and perspective on dealing with people from lower income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I completely agree with you. I, I will, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have a relationship with Mr. Grimaldi, um, but I do have a relationship with the president of the union, um, uh, Ray Hunt. And, um, and, you know, I will be, I'll be honest with you. Um, Mr. Hunt has been incredibly helpful to me. Uh, he has been honest and transparent. Now, do we agree all the time? Absolutely not. But at least I know that he gives me the proper information. I'll give you a good case in point. I asked for the use of force uh, policies that were in place uh, through HPD when I was doing my amendments, and I got a redacted copy. 
and um, I called Mr. Hunt, and he gave me the unredacted copy. And so, you know, in those ways, he is trying, I, I believe, you know, we have a good relationship, we have a good understanding, we respect each other's differences in terms of what that looks like. And to be honest, that's who I interact with. So I, I think that you've noticed Mr. Grimaldi has been pulled away a little bit from the microphone. They've actually put someone else now, the attorney, I can't call his name right now, but he's speaking a little bit more for him um, because they do recognize that uh, Grimaldi gets incredibly emotional. He says things that probably are not, well, or not probably should not be said uh, publicly. And it's absolutely important for us to make sure we build relationships between policing and our, and our communities. And so I deal with Mr. Hunt, uh, to be honest. Um, and like I said, we don't always agree, but I know if I call him and ask him for something, he will at least give me what I'm asking for, right? And then I can do my own research, ask my own questions, and get the, the answers. Um, but transparency is a very big part of this thing. And, and one thing that we need to really push um, our administration for is to, to really look at this contract differently. We need to look at what the police contract looks like and, and to have an opportunity to at least evaluate it and see what we can, um, what we can, you know, we can discuss and agree on. And one thing I want to say that we do agree on is that is my cahoots program, that um, that mental health support uh, crisis intervention uh, program. I have good support from them on that. And so, you know, I'm the kind of person that I know we're gonna have lots of differences, but I try to find where we can see some similarities and where we can find um, just a little bit of balance, and at least try to work from that angle and then work through the differences. You know, all obviously, uh, you know, some Simultaneously, but um, Grimaldi does say some things he probably she does. He definitely says some things he probably should not say. Uh, but my interaction, like I said, is, is, with, is with Mr. Hunt, and he's been supportive um, of the things that we're trying to push through and the changes that we're trying to get done. Okay, most definitely. Okay, now yeah. uh, this question is now: What is the most important part of the proposal that you want to connect with uh, police? and citizens of the community? You know, I think that the CAHOOTS program is probably the most important just because um, we were finding that upwards of 60% of people that have interaction with police have some type of mental health challenge. And so I believe that we need to look at how we're policing our mental health patients a bit closer. I don't believe a police needs to be involved in that. I do believe it needs to be a social worker and a medic to help them kind of work through the process. Um, that would be my number one issue. Um, my number two would probably be the the um, the IPOB, the Independent Police Oversight Board, completely reevaluating that and, and giving it some subpoena power, giving it some funding to make sure that we can do our independent research and trying to separate that as much as we can from the police department so the influences aren't there. So we can have actual independent oversight in terms of what um, we need to we need to you know to move on. Um, and the other I would say probably would be um, our, our body cam on footage and how we're gonna look at that and how we're gonna release it and when we're gonna release it and what that looks like. Uh, I mean, there's so many things, but I would say if I could think of the three top things I want to see happen, like right now, uh, those three things I would, I would, I would put on the forefront. Okay. Okay. Now, the reason why I say that is because I work in behavior um, um, with children um, okay. uh, for the last, uh, I believe, about seven years. And one mm -hmm. of the things that we're trained is to de-escalate situations. And I think mm -hmm. that's the main part of, of actually you know, when you're doing your job, but doing your job efficiently and knowing how to deal with people because everybody, uh, like, every, like you can't say the same things the same way with everybody, uh, especially in a forceful manner. Because I believe at the end of the day, before police officers or sheriffs or constables or anybody approach anybody, that person is a man or a woman first. You give them that respect. You don't expect, you don't demand respect from people that don't know you don't have, they have never had an encounter with you. So they don't even know what the outcome and nine times out of 10 and what we looked at at George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, um, this, I can't even go all over this country. Uh, uh, Amadou Diallo, uh, who was, uh, who was an immigrant who, who got shot by police 41 mm -hmm. times. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Sean Bell, I mean, it, it's countless of others who've Bless never really all. had encounters like that with police. And it ends up from a mere miscommunication to a murder. 
Mm-hmm. And I, and I believe that the behavior, and I believe that, and, and I'm just saying this from an honest perspective. I think a lot of times af- in those encounters, I believe month to month that the police officers should be evaluated monthly from a mental perspective. Cause yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, because this is the thing. Every day they put their uniform on, they're experiencing trauma. Every day. And so when you're experiencing that much small levels of trauma, even if they haven't had interaction, right? That's got to change your mindset. It's got to change how you look at things, your perspective. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, they only get one psychological evaluation, and that's before they even get on the force. So they've been people on the force for 20 years and, and haven't even had one unless they have some type of issue. Um, and so, no, I, I'm 100% in agreement with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what I want to ask is, uh, what can the citizens in the city of Houston do in support of your proposal? I mean, what is it that people can actually, uh, you know, get into, get behind, uh, maybe funding or, uh, or even lobbying uh, behind getting this thing uh, to the forefront to the city of Houston? No, that's a great question. So let me kind of give you a kind of a gauge of how the city works. So council members don't have any real um, power to put things on an agenda. But what we can do if nine council members come together, not come together, but if agree or on the same page in terms of what they want to see happen, typically the idea is pushed by the community and this is where the community comes in if there's something they want to see have happen the nine people come together we say listen we do agree on this one issue let's just come let's go to the mayor and say listen mayor you know what are your thoughts about having a deeper conversation about this particular issue that is a very fair way of working with the working with the administration to get something done and so my ask for the community is please don't let all these all these you know, murders in my mind, right, that have happened to innocent people uh, continue to happen. Really uh, continue to let your council members, your district council members know what's important to you. We've got to keep our foot on the gas. We cannot let go of this as an issue. Just because we're not mar- marching in thousands, right, doesn't mean we can't call in thousands. You know, um, you can call on, on Tuesdays in public session for something happening on council that you're not aware of. Just have to call in because before, you know, before we could, you know, come in to council meetings, but now obviously we're during COVID, we're doing everything, you know, virtually. But those are the ways that communities can really come in and be a part of the, of the situation. Um, because we need to get things done. Uh, I know that our task force is going to be releasing the recommendations pretty soon. Um, but those, those, whatever the recommendations are, are great, but we got to attach policy and execution to them. So, you know, th- that's kind of where in my mind, the community really can, can jump in and help out, is if they see certain issues that they want to have change, then um, they need to call their members, send emails to their members, let their members know, listen, this is important to me, I want to see uh, the needle move on this, and, um, and if, you ta- if you call us enough, you know, then you'll have, like we had that public safety meeting in the last seven and a half hours, you know, uh, we, we, we have to force to listen. Because what I want everyone that's listening and watching tonight to understand, you are the reason we're here. I didn't luck up and pull a straw and win this race. You voted for me. And so it is my duty to make sure that I represent the communities. And so just the same way that I care that, you know, um, and it's very important to me. All the other members should feel the same way. And so our goal and our first priority is to make sure that our citizens are taken care of. Okay. Um, now, uh, what else is in store for Letitia Plummer? And if uh, you're going to another position in the city of Houston, maybe like mayor or governor, uh, what, what might be in your future? Oh gosh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, you know, God has brought brought me to this place. I had no intentions on being here, but He has put me here. Um, I'm going to continue to do the good work. I'm going to continue to do my best to make my communities happy and proud that they voted me in this space. And then I'm going to see what doors God opens for me. And then if we're to walk through them, then we're going to run through them. 
but um, I will I will keep things open. I I, um, I hope to have two terms on council because I feel like there's a lot of work that needs to get done, and I do get eight years to do that in. I just turned fifty, so I'm still young. <laughs> yep, I've got yep. plenty of time. And <laughs> I've got plenty of time. About to be an empty nester. My boys are going to be in college soon, so. Um, I, I like I like the political space. I really do. Uh, I'm a policy writer. I'm an activist at heart, and um, so I, I don't think this is definitely not the end of what I want to do. I just don't know what direction that's going to take me yet. Okay. Um, now, what do you say to the young people in the city of Houston that want to follow in your footsteps and learn how the city works? Yeah. So if you're uh, if you're in college, uh, college age, and you've got you know uh, pu public policy, um, you know background, or you want to you know focus or major in public policy or political science, um, send me an email at large four at houstontx.gov. We take interns all the time. Actually, all of our council members do. So definitely get in that space. If you want to run for office, I would tell you to get on a campaign and volunteer. On a campaign, you know, you got to do the grunt work to see what that, how hard it is to win races. I always tell people, where I got my start, you know, um, in terms of politics. So get involved, call us. We take interns. Um, intern, um, you know, change your major to political science so you get more experience in what that looks like, and um, and find a mentor. Find someone in the community um, that's willing to kind of, you know, and I do that for my, my interns that come in my office. They learn the ropes. They do a lot of research for us. They help us write policy and, and, um, and change what Houston looks like. So that's what I would, I would um, definitely recommend to any young people that want to get involved in, in this political space. Okay. Um, when you're taking a break outside of politics and, you know, and getting things done in the city of Houston, what does uh, Letitia Plummer like to do? Oh, yeah. So I love yoga. I get on my mat on a daily basis. Um, I ride my bike all the time. I love riding. Uh, so I, I love being outdoors. Um, sleeping is my new best friend when I can. <laughs> I'll grab a nap as quickly as I can. Um, but my family is important, too. Uh, you know, COVID has been rough in terms of spending time with my parents and my grandmother. She's one of my favorite people. Um, so I spend a lot of time with my family. Um, but I think that I'm just trying to... Um, you know, and every now and then I'll take a little staycation, try to get away and turn my phone off, you know, for a moment. But uh, but most of the time you can you can find me, you know, practicing yoga somewhere on my bike. I mean, those are those are my two favorite things. Um, and, and, and water. If there's a pool anywhere or any any body of water close, I'm I'm trying to get as close to it as possible. Uh, but um, but I'm pretty intense. I'm pretty intense personality. I work real hard. I'm a workaholic. But, uh, but I enjoy I enjoy what I do, and so I'm still practicing full time, um, and which is which is great too. So um, so yeah, that's kind of you know, that's kind of my world. <laughs> um, anything that you uh, um, outside of um, work, um, what's your what's your next step as far as uh, this this to end to get to the end of the year? Uh, anything that you want to get done uh, on the forefront? Uh, for the citizens, uh, citizens of Houston? Absolutely. Yeah, no, great. These are such great questions, Robert. Seriously, these are such great questions. So the uh, task force is going to release their, their recommendations pretty soon. So we're going to dig really deep in those and see what those look like and, um, and see how do we create policy um, for whatever those recommendations are and, and timelines, right? Um, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, you know, you probably hear the word food desert a lot, um, but I use the word food apartheid. And the reason why I've changed that word is because um, it's a way of, of, of keeping people down. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't find a uh, lack of grocery stores in, in, um, in, in wealthy areas. You only find in areas that are typically, um, you know, poor. And, um, and, and, and with high levels of disparities. And so uh, bringing fresh food to neighborhoods is really going to be important to me. We've gotten two full food, um, two gardens. We've got a um, one acre garden um, and a five acre garden that we're cultivating right now. And we're working in conjunction with some community um, activists. And, um, and also with um, some developers to put these up, these pop up. Uh, these pop-up um, grocery stores, so to speak, but just for produce. 
um, in, in, in different neighborhoods to, 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 to bring more good food and good vegetables and fresh food to the table. Um, and then as you know, from my, from my background with healthcare, um, bringing some wraparound services with healthcare, making sure that the healthcare disparities are eliminated in our communities. Um, you know, we're, we're in the middle of COVID right now. People are talking about COVID is killing black and brown people the most, but everything kills black and brown people the most. It's not just this. It's, it's because we don't have access to health care. And so trying to figure out a way to make health care accessible is, is definitely on my list. I mean, those are huge wish lists. So those are probably my four-year plan, to be honest, because those are really big changes that can't happen overnight. But those are the three top things that I really want to see um, come to fruition, at least the first phase of it, uh, before the end of my first, my first year in, in session. Okay. Um, definitely. Um, I don't want to take up any uh, too much more of your time. Um, just to let you know that um, the List Yap About It podcast is definitely uh, 100% behind your proposal. Um, I definitely placed it on my Facebook group. I'm going to place it again on my Facebook group so people can actually have access to it so they can actually go through it detailed to okay. see exactly what's uh, to be changed within the communities. And I believe, like you said, on both parts, for the citizens and also for the police department, they need to be evaluated more and more directly and more sternly because like I said, it's our mission to um, to stop what's going on in our communities and to push forward in a, in a progressive way. And that's what we, this is what we're talking about on, on my podcast is about progression. You don't want to have a situation where we're talking about it for years and years and years. We want to figure out some way that we can push forward and progress for uh, people of color. And I'm just not just saying just black folks in general, but Hispanics, Puerto Ricans, because like you said, we're made, Houston is made up of a lot of uh, considered minorities. And that's what we need. We need everybody to be on the same page uh, as far as black um, uh, people of color progression. So definitely. Yeah. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And there, there was, I, I just had a thought that I wanted to, um, you know, people talk about what we're talking about, Robert, in a way that they're progressive ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Or that this is something that's different or special or too, too far left. We're just treating people as human beings. I mean, it's just the basic respect that you give another person that's breathing, you know, that breathes on a daily basis. This isn't, we have made this thing so special and so big and so um, complicated that we've lost the fact that we, our parents taught us this when we were one years old. Treat people in the same way that you want to be treated. And it's, it's as simple as that. You know what I'm saying? And so we have to get back to being good people and causing good trouble, right? And so um, that's where we have to be. And we have to understand all of us play a role in it. Um, and all of us can make the change happen, but we have to force the change. We can, people in the public sector, I, one thing I've realized is they're very complacent. Kicking the can down the road is like the normal daily thing to do. No one really expects anything big or grand to happen. And when you want something to happen, then you're naturally impatient. That perspective in our at large four is not there. We are in office to make change. I wouldn't have sacrificed a whole two years of my life and, and, and taken people's money that donated to me to sit in a chair and just knock a can down the road, that that's not the intention. And so I want all of us as black and brown people, to, I want to end in with this. We have to get to a point to where accepting the minimum is unacceptable. Right. We, we accept the very, very little on a consistent basis. It is just embarrassing. We have to get to a point to where we expect big things. And when you start expecting big things, then you put in the hard work and you stay with it and you and you and you're focused and you're determined, but that's what it's gonna take. I am done. I am done accepting just a little bit of something, just to shut us up and get us to do whatever. It is time to expect big stuff. And that's what I'm asking our listeners tonight. Like Expect counsel to do something. 
Just let that be the expectation. And then when we don't, then you're going to be disappointed. And what happens when you're disappointed? You complain and you fight and you push, right? And that's what we need to see more of. We need to see more pushing um, and, and, and holding us accountable. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so that's it. That's what I got to say tonight. Thank you. And I actually did this for all the neighborhoods. I did this for Greens Point. I did this for Fifth Ward. I did this for Trinity Garden. I did Lakewood. I did this for Second Ward. I did this for Third Ward. I did this for South Park. I did this for South Lawn. I did this for uh, for, uh, for Mo City, for all people of color who actually experience negative experience with police officers. We are going to push forward and we are going to move forward culturally and we are going to move forward with passing these laws and getting these things done on behalf of black people. Absolutely. Well, I'm all in. You have a champion here with you. You got full support from me. Whatever we can do in our office, um, please let me know. I would love to, to chat with you again when this police over when this um, task force makes the release of their of their recommendations. Love to have a deeper conversation, um, and let's just kind of come up with a plan of action how we can make sure that he's in a better and safer place for our black folks. Honestly, let's do it. And I'm definitely okay. for support. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great way to start my week. I'm very, very grateful. Thanks for getting the word out to people. Um, you know, they always, the, 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 as if they're saying that if you don't want people to know stuff, put it in a book. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we don't get the information, right? And getting it out there is, is huge. So, so thank you for that. Um, I appreciate your, you using your platform for getting good messages out to our communities. Thank you. Thank you again. And it was a pleasure to have you on the Let's Yap About It podcast. All right. Thank you. Take it easy, okay? All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Black child, gun down. Shot a nigga like it's cool. We don't make the news. We don't get to go to school. Blood all on the shoes. We can't even win for losing. My life ain't even sending off commissary and open obituaries. The family is on my bed.